Hello everybody and good evening. I am Dr. Harold Bennett and I am the Dean of our phenomenal graduate school, the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I welcome you to our 52nd Founders Week celebrations. Thank you for joining us. I am so glad that you will be a part of the activities this week. You know, I, I thank the Lord for our presiding bishop, Bishop J. Drew Sheard. I thank the Lord for our general board. I thank the Lord for the chairman of the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, Bishop David Hall, who is a general board member. I thank the Lord for our general supervisor, Mother McCool Lewis. I tell you, the people of God have really looked after our seminary and prayed for us. And, and I'm just glad that you are a part of what we're going to do this week. The Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary is a part of the ITC. Now the ITC opened in 1958. So the ITC has been doing business for a long time, training men and women for ministry in the Church of God in Christ. And the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary is a part of this great work. This week, oh, we got a lot planned for you. We're gonna talk about enhancing the, the teaching and learning ministry in our local churches. I am really trusting the Lord, and I believe it's gonna happen, that what we're talking about this week will be a blessing to you and your ministry. So tell everybody about what we're doing this week as we celebrate 52 years of educating, equipping, and training men and women for ministry in the Church of God in Christ and throughout the world. God bless you. Good evening, church. My name is Minister Glenn Washington. Uh, I'm presently a graduate student at the ITC C.H. Mason uh, Seminary. Um, I am with the graduating class of 2024. Uh, bow with me as we pray and uh, give honor to God um, for this great church on this wonderful evening. Father God, we thank you so much for this evening. We give you all honor and praise for everything that you've done, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for uh, overshadowing uh, the, this church of God in Christ with your blessing and giving us a sense of your presence. And as we continue to, to do the things that we're called to, Father God, that you have uh, overwhelmed us, Father God, with your presence and, and given us a sense that you're there. So we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless and and um, uh, honor those leaders in this church, Father God. Continue to give them a sense of your goodness in every moment. We appreciate you, Father God, because you are Lord. We thank you, Father God, because you have shown us your inconspicuous grace, Father God, through this pandemic, through this Omicron, through this Delta variant, Father God, that no thing is more powerful than you. Nothing is more than your overwhelming presence. So we ask, Lord, that you would continue to sanctify and bless everything that we're about to do as a church and how you've given this church such um, grace and uh, we're grateful, Father God, for your presence. So we would ask, Lord, that you would sanctify the rest of this evening, give us a sense of your presence, and kiss the worship for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. We give you all honor and praise. Amen. Good evening. I am Diane Lewis, and I am from the class of 79 of the C.H. Mason Theological Center. And um, my task this evening is to read our scripture. Our scripture comes from Proverbs, the 18th chapter and the 15th verse. And it reads as follow. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. God bless you. Hello, this is Bishop David Allen Hall, general board member and president of the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary Board of Trustees. Welcome to the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary Founders Week for 2022. I greet you in the name of Jesus and for the board of trustees, for Dr. Harold Bennett, president and dean of the seminary, 
all the staff and faculty of the school. We thank God for your presence here, and we are so glad for, of course, this opportunity to present the seminary, the world's only black accredited Pentecostal seminary, and this seminary serves the church of God in Christ, serves the church worldwide, more than 300 graduates now serving as bishops in our church, supervisors, those who serve on national boards, elected officials, who serve in the capacity of institutional ministries, chaplains in our armed forces and in other institutions, business, teaching college and graduate school. We have our graduates as pastors and also as ministry professionals doing numerous things wherever it needs to be done. We thank you for coming to visit with us and allow me to say for the school, for the board of trustees and all of you that this is your seminary and this presentation celebrates what God has done for us, not only as a church, but as an academic institution serving humanity as well. Let me say it in the words of Bishop J.O. Patterson Sr. To have your burning while you have your learning. We do not forget who we are. We have not forgotten about the burning power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And so enjoy this presentation. We greet you and believe that this will be something that you will find quite interesting and very satisfying. God bless you. Thank you. Hello, friends. I'm Bishop Chadwick F. Carlton, Commissioner of Education, Church of God in Christ. You know, religious and theological education is critical to the spiritual, mental, and physical maturation of the believer and cleric who discerns personal callings to reveal the mysteries of God through authoritative sources, both primary and secondary. Charles Harrison Mason Seminary, one of our few instructional venues in graduate school, pauses now on the 52nd Founders Week of the Charles Harrison Mason Seminary to commemorate the indelible imprint of our beloved founder left on Christian education in the corpus of theological and religious reflection, but also promotes the importance of religious education in the local assembly. Throughout history, educational modules reminiscent to Sunday school, YPWW and Bible study have all aided to increase the aptitude of the Christian believer and undergirded measurable transformation of the human heart. Those traditional hallmarks live onward today to belie some of the evils of postmodernity that promote religious pluralism, syncretism, and other unorthodox forms of religious expression that obscure the revelation of God through Jesus Christ. So it is important that we do not reduce the number of educational opportunities in our local assemblies, but enhance the ones we have and pray for fresh vision to add necessary and relevant educational components that take into account a society that is becoming increasingly cosmopolitan and liberal in scope. This week, we celebrate our Pentecostal roots that are often expressed through charisms of the Holy Spirit and the intentionality of our beloved founder, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, who searched the scriptures and other credible sources voraciously to ground his religious experience. And our quest should be no less than the precedent established by Bishop Mason to study advently and find ways to incorporate new forms of religious education that are adaptable to those in the local church. The theme of Founders Week this year is enhancing the teaching ministry of the local church. There will be sessions from an array of presenters that will no doubt elicit thought-provoking themes from the Bible and supplemental sources you may choose to take back to your local assemblies and implement. While listening to the presenters, please provide your sentiments and or questions in the chat room. Your robust engagement will enhance the online experience for all participants. Charles Harrison Mason Seminary Founders Week, a commemoration of the past and an endearment to a promising future that juxtaposes relevant education and experience, the embodiment of Pentecostal expression. You don't want to miss this week. Happy Founders Week. Good evening and welcome to our third night of our C.H. Mason Founders Week celebration. I do give honor to God on tonight, our presiding bishop, Bishop J. Drew Sheard, First Lady Karen Sheard, our general supervisor, Mother Barbara McCool-Lewis, 
During a board member, Bishop David Hall, the chairman of the board of trustees, and to our esteemed and devoted dean, Dr. Harold Bennett. We are so grateful and thankful for Dr. Bennett on tonight, and he has certainly prepared himself for this moment. So we are so glad to have all of you joining in with us on tonight. We pray that this information you're receiving this week will motivate, encourage, and help you to be more effective in your ministry at the local church. I am Dr. Catherine Primus. I received my bachelor's of Christian education from Beulah Heights University, my master of divinity and master of Christian education from the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. And I received my doctorate of Christian education from Logos University. I worked in the public school system for over 15 years in Clayton County and DeKalb County. I am the owner and director of Touching Others, which is a tutorial service from pre-K through college. I am one of the writers for the interpretive expository for the annual Sunday school lesson commentary. I currently serve as a district missionary and the assistant supervisor of the Western Georgia Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction under the leadership of Bishop John Thomas, First Lady Mother Inez Thomas, and our supervisor, Mother Perella Hines. I thank God for my loving, devoted husband and pastor, Administrator Sister Roy Jean Primus Sr., my three sons, Roy Jr., Darwin Lewis, and Reginald Dante, and my two daughters in love, Christina and Sonia, and my two wonderful grands, Desire and Jaden Primus. Tonight, we will be dealing with another great topic, assessing and enhancing the teaching ministry of the local church. The presenters tonight are two distinguished educators in their own right. Dr. Goldie Frinks Wells, who is under the leadership of Bishop Leroy Jackson Willard and Supervisor Harazine Keyes of the Greater North Carolina Jurisdiction. Dr. Wells is the mother of one adult daughter and son-in-law, Bishop Charles Johnson, and three granddaughters. She is a retired educator, has served as president of Saints Academy and College in Lexington, Mississippi, as Title I director for the Iredell Statesville School, and taught in the Riley Wake and Guilford County School System in the state of North Carolina. Dr. Wells is a member of the Board of Trustees of Wells Memorial Church of God in Christ, a district missionary, and is the former national director of the C.H. Mason Jurisdictional Institutes of the Church of God in Christ Incorporated. She was elected Greensburg Councilwoman District 2 in 2005, and currently she is serving as Councilwoman for the district again. Originally, she is from Eaton, North Carolina. Dr. Wells has undergraduate and graduate degrees from Hampton University and North Carolina a and State University, and doctorates from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Wells, we are so glad to have you with us on tonight. And Dr. Lawrence Williams, he serves with the Northern Central Georgia under the leadership of Bishop Joseph Hogan's and supervisor, Mother Mary B. Tucker. Dr. Williams hails from the state of Connecticut. Dr. Williams is called to be a teacher and to prepare for this vocation, he earned a bachelor's of arts degree from the University of Connecticut a Master of Science degree in Special Education from Southern Connecticut State University, a Special degree in Educational Leadership from Georgia State University, a Master of Divinity degree in Christian Education, and a Doctorate of Ministry degree, both from the Interdenominational Theological Center. Over the course of his career, he served as a teacher, an assistant principal for the Brycliffs High School and Dunwoody High School. 
and a principal for the Peachtree Middle School in the DeKalb County school system. Additionally, in the private sector, he became an entrepreneur and co-owner of Edwin Incorporated, Golden Generation Personal Care Home, and New Generation Learning Center, and Christian Academy. At the New Generation, he served as principal and the pre-K program director. So in an effort to promote quality in the childcare industry, Dr. Williams served as president of the DeKalb United Care Care Association and board member of the Georgia Child Care Association. Currently, he is the administrator at Green Pastures Academy. So being an ordained elder and a member of the Church of God in Christ, Dr. Williams has provided leadership in several capacities. He has been a choir director, chairman of finance, director of worship, associate pastor, jurisdictional superintendent of Sunday School, Central Georgia, secretary of the International Department of Evangelism, assistant dean for the International Missions Department, and secretary of the Board of Trustees for the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary. Currently, he serves as director of leadership development at the Cathedral of Faith Church of God in Christ. In broadening his experiences in ministry, Dr. Williams has served on the mission field. God has opened the doors for him to provide consultation for church schools in foreign countries. He has done so on two trips to Ghana and five trips to Malaysia. Dr. Williams is a proud father of a son, Lawrence II and daughter, Lauren, and the grandfather of three. Though God has allowed him to accomplish these things in life, his consistent challenge is remaining obedient to God. God bless you, Dr. Williams. I hope you have your pens and notepads ready to take notes, assessing and enhancing the teaching ministry in the local church. We are all aware that the local church plays a major role within our organization, the Church of God in Christ worldwide. So in order for our local churches to mature and grow effectively, we need to assess and enhance our teaching ministry in the local church. So our intention tonight is to answer the following questions. What is Christian education? Why do we need Christian education? Who will teach Christian education? And how will we enhance the teaching ministry of the local church or in the local church? And what is your church doing? All right, Show Dr. It. Williams. Show it. All right. As we begin our discussion this evening, I think it's important that we start with one understanding of what we're talking about. Uh, we, we have generally used the term Christian education, but we want to have one common understanding of that term. So we want to start with defining what Christian education is. Want to give this definition that Christian education is that ministry of the church that supports and undergirds all other ministries of the church. Now, it's important here to understand that Christian education is not just that entity that deals with uh, our typical teaching ministries, such as Sunday school, uh, we have vacation Bible school, and the other teaching ministries in the church. But when we think of Christian education, it's that ministry that provides support for every auxiliary and function in the church regardless of what auxiliary it is, regardless of what department it falls under, Christian education supports, walks alongside each one of those ministries to undergird that ministry. So it's not just localized to just one or partic one particular department, but it encompasses the whole church. Any thoughts on that? Well, that's good, Dr. Williams. And, and uh, looking at this, how do the other ministries support uh, the ministries of the church? What, in other words, what role do they play? 
Well, the role that Christian education plays with all the ministries is the fact that we've got to understand that the church really is a school. And as a school, every part of the ministry is designed to grow. If something is not growing, then it's either stagnating or dying. But our desire is that every entity of the church is in a growth mode. So in order for that to be so, we have to have something there that's encouraging growth. So Christian education is there to help every department, every ministry, every auxiliary to look at what it's doing so that it could then understand how to do it better. Because one of the things is, you no, know, regardless of how well we are functioning, we should want to do it better. So Christian education helps each leader, each auxiliary, each function to look at what it's doing and identify what it needs to do in order to grow. So would you say that Christian education is the foundation of a growing mature church? Oh, absolutely. Without that, I don't think we can say that the church is maturing or growing. Um, maturing means that it is growing, it is developing. So yes, Christian education has to be that central focus that, uh, that's part of every maturing church. Thank you. Now we, we provided this definition. I also wanna enhance on that definition and provide a second definition, which is that Christian education is a ministry in the church that involves learning programs and strategies to facilitate the spiritual growth and discipleship of believers into Christ likeness. And I think this really kind of captures in a great way what we're really talking about what Christian education does. And it's a ministry in the church that involves learning programs. So again, it's not just Sunday school, not just Vacation Bible School, YPWW, but it's every entity ought to look at how it could design a learning program to help that entity to grow and to provide and facilitate spiritual growth and discipleship. Because it's important that we understand that our purpose as a church is to develop disciples. I would agree, and especially Christ, Christ likeness. Yes. We all want to be, we sing the songs all the time, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. Yes. But without teaching and uh, the Christian education programs in our church, we will not have that happen with all of our believers. So the, the Christian education is, is very, very important mm -hmm. for everyone. And, you know, and going back to the term Christian education, we've not utilized that term very much in our no. churches. Uh, and I would hope that it's something that we can embrace and understand that it needs to be a part of everything that we do. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. I, I think we, we kind of think about we have some learning uh, and some teaching going on, but it's kind of in silos. And to think about yeah. what we're, we're talking about is a, a solid curriculum, a solid program that embraces um, all ages and, and our classes. All right, thank you, very good. All right, now we wanna talk about, since we have defined Christian education, why do we need Christian education? What is the purpose of it? Glad you're asking that question. Uh, I think it's a great follow-up to uh, how we've defined Christian education. That number one, one reason why we need Christian education is to equip children, adults, and families to understand God's word. Now, what did we mean? I want to grab hold of some of these terms in here. What does it mean when we talk about equipping children, adults, and families? What we're saying is we want to properly prepare every person that's a member of the church from, as we say, from the cradle to the grave. Yes. to help them yes. to understand God's word. And, and you know what? I want to go to a particular scripture uh, that I think really helps us to understand what it really means to equip. And I want to go to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. And Deuteronomy, sixth chapter, starting at the first verse, the fifth verse. And it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. 
And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. You know, and for me, this really capsulizes what it really means to equip children, adults, and families to understand God's word. To, in order to equip, we've got to be diligent about the task of teaching. And in order to be, to be diligent, we've got to give a wholehearted effort. One of the things I think about is uh, we have children, adults, and families come to church how often? They may come on uh, for Bible study. They come on Sunday morning. That's how many hours out of the whole week. Mm -hmm. That may be at the most, maybe five hours out of the whole week. What happens with the people the other hours when they're not sitting in that sanctuary? We've mm -hmm. got to provide a kind of program of study to help them to understand God's word and to be taught God's word, even when they're at home. And so that, that passage in Deuteronomy helps us understand that Christian education not only happens within the four walls of the church, but we've also have to have it extend to the home because that's where the majority of the teaching is gonna occur. It says, if we really look at it there, and everything that they do, when, when the child, when the child gets up in the morning, when yes. they're walking, when they walk out of the house, when they're lying down at night, every opportunity we ought to be taking to teach God's word. That's how we need to equip children, adults, and families to understand God's word. Amen. So it starts with the children, and we can get oh, yeah. that within our children as they grow up. They will already be equipped as young teenagers and then adults uh, to with the word of God. And so I agree with that. So we need to start, the, the foundation is with those children, with the babies, as they grow up, that they would be able to learn how to live a holy life. And you know what, not only that, it starts with the children, but the same way that we teach children is the same way we really need to teach adults too. We need to be just as diligent with them. Uh, what did they say? Uh, repetition is the greatest teacher. That's the greatest teaching method is repetition. So we've got to find opportunities to continually repeat, repeat, repeat what it is we need to teach. In uh, educational theory, they say that really a piece of information is not yours until you've been exposed to it right. about how many times? About 30 times. Yeah. So until you've heard a piece of information, an educational bite, an informational bite, you really, it's not part of you until you've been exposed to it many, many times over. And that's true. And I agree with that because a lot of our adults did not attend Sunday school, did not attend Bible studies. And so they missed out on all of these things that we're talking about tonight. So I agree that we need to be able to equip the adults oh, all the <clears throat> Uh, you, you just mentioned something that triggered in me, too, in the fact that uh, a lot of our adults aren't in our Bible studies. Mm -hmm. We have the greatest number of people to attend church on Sunday morning. Uh, when, when it comes to Bible study time, we have just a fraction of the people attending there. That's true. Mm -hmm. So we really need to capitalize on the time that we have the most people there, which is the Sunday morning worship. Yes. How does the Sunday morning worship turn into an opportunity for teaching and learning? Becomes a question. My goodness. Yes. So that's well, number one. Me, that's one. Yes, Our, I was say, just going to say, <laughs> you have some others. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> You know, there's so much uh, packed into these uh, goal statements here. Yeah. Uh, the second thing we want to look at, uh, the second goal, the reason why we need Christian education is to teach believers how to apply 
and communicate God's truth in all areas of life. Yeah. Now, one of the things in education theory is that we may learn something, but we really haven't learned it until we have learned how to apply it. Yes. So one of the things as we teach, we need to provide opportunities for people to apply what has been learned. And we not only teach them to apply it in the church setting, and sometimes we kind of, uh, we put limits on where this is supposed to operate. And we just tend to think about what we learn is to be applied within the four walls of the church. But what we learn ought to be applied in every area of life. Mm -hmm. We need to think about the fact that everybody is not going to stand in the pulpit to preach or teach. Mm -hmm. But we, every one of us has a kingdom assignment. And that's a kingdom assignment is anywhere where God has placed us in the marketplace. We have people that are teachers. We have people that are business work in corporations, uh, wherever it is your assignment is, we ought to be able to take God's truth and to be able to apply it in that area wherever we are. All right. And this goes back uh, to the first one of equipping our children and adults and our families to understand God's word. Because the only way that they can apply it is that they have to understand it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Application is so a very vital part of the learning process. And as we're talking about the teaching process, but I don't want to get us stuck there. I want to move on. We've got a third objective, a uh, third goal, and that is to impart God's word at age appropriate levels, including both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, it's important to know that when we're teaching, that teaching has to be done at uh, levels that are appropriate to the learner. We talk very much about scripture in terms of milk of the word and the meat of the word. Mm -hmm. If we give the meat of the word to young persons, to infants, they're going to choke on that. Mm -hmm. So we've got to know what to teach at certain ages, to know that there are some things that if we give it at an early age, that it's going to choke that person. And we not only look at age in terms of naturally, but we need to think of it spiritually also, that for the person that is very young in Christ, that there are certain things that they may not need. They need the milk of the word at those early stages, because if we give them the meat of the word too early, it's going to choke them. Mm -hmm. So again, we've got to know how to impart God's word at appropriate levels, according to the learner. And that also that, you know, sometimes we have some of us that prefer the Old Testament, some that prefer the New Testament. And we tend to do all of our uh, teaching and preaching in just one testament. But we've got to provide the whole Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. All right. And when you think about it, a lot of people do uh, like the New Testament better because the Old Testament, the language of the Old Testament is kind of like hard for them to understand and the words are hard to pronounce and different things. So they prefer the New Testament, but nevertheless, we still have to get and impart God's word from the Old Testament as well as from the New Testament so they can get a good understanding of the whole picture. True. Now, I wanna to go to our fourth goal, the fourth reason why we need Christian education. It's to offer a dynamic Christian education program to attract participation of all age groups, encourage one another, and foster fellowship and relationships. I think the operative, one of the operative words here is offering a dynamic Christian education program. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be sure that we offer the kind of learning uh, environments where we're attracting people of all ages. Uh, some of our churches may have uh, a lot of older people. Some may have a lot of younger people. But we've got to have a program that's going to attract all ages. Uh, if we're going to attract some of the young people in their 20s, and all, these are people that have grown up with a lot of technology in their lives, how do we make use of the technology to be able to attract them? 
So we've got to design programs that are, sometimes we've got to come out of our own box because, you know, we teach according to what's comfortable for us. <laughs> yes. But we sometimes we've got to step out of that box of comfort and be able to offer programs that are going to attract uh, other age groups and other people. Right. And the other thing that to think about with this too is that we've got to uh, encourage one another and foster fellowship and relationship. In this day and age, that's, that's a real challenge for us as a church. Particularly during the pandemic, people have been locked in their homes away from one another. We live in a day and time when we don't live in real community. If we think back to when we were growing up, I really believe we lived in community. Yes. Uh, we knew the neighbors around us. The neighbors knew us. And basically the people in our neighborhood, we all went to the same church. Yes. So we had a natural community built in because we lived in one particular geographical area. But now we live in a time when the people that go to a church don't live in the same neighborhood. We don't really know one another. So we've got to create community. We've got to help people to develop relationships. So we, it's important too that we foster fellowship within our congregation. That's good, but do you have any type of idea how we can get this to happen? And I agree with that 100%. Uh, that's a good question. What kind of things that can we do to offer fellowship? Um, we can create certain ministries. And I think uh, in our list that we'll see further on in this presentation, we'll see where we have ways of fostering fellowship. We can offer such things as the single ministry, married couple ministry, people who have some things in common, we group them together. And so, you know, with that commonality, that will help them to develop some sense of fellowship and some sense of community. So when, the thing is, we've got to be intentional about it. We can't just say, well, people will develop their own relationships. We have to help creating an atmosphere and environment where that can happen. All right. All right. Dr. Wells, did you want to add anything to that? Well, all the things that have been said, those objectives and our goals of what we are uh, aiming for, we want them to be. But this is what we're trying to do is to give you some, some um insight into the importance of the educational program in each one of our local churches. So we have quite a bit of information. So I'm, I'll add something later on. I make I want to make sure we get our information <laughs> over before we just do all these comments. Okay. All right, thank you. We now gonna to go to who will teach. All right, Dr. Wells. Who all right, will so we, we, we've talked about the, the the need why, we've talked about um, the, the, the how and why we need Christian education, but there is a, a, a very important part of it and who will do it. Mm -hmm. And in the church, we need teachers. Teachers are the key. We read in uh, Ephesians 4 and 11 in the King James Version, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The ministry of a teacher, and we hear the five-fold ministry all the time, but the teacher is very important because it's for the perfecting of the ministry. It's for the growth of individuals. It's for the growth of the whole body. The teaching ministry is a building ministry. So mm -hmm. those who have a God-given gift to teach are those who we should have teaching us, mm -hmm. teaching in our churches. It, it is a gift and everybody does not have the gift. So it's important when we are selecting our teachers for, the, uh, for our education program that we have teachers who have that God-given gift. They can take a vision or the principles of, of God and they can expand on them and break them into smaller sections so that uh, others can understand and put those truths into practice in their life. In other words, a teacher brings the word of God 
to apply in issues in their own daily lives. Yeah. Without the, that ministry, we listen to and read about the wonderful things of God, but we don't know what to do with them. So the teacher helps us to understand. And we can read the wonderful things and then we don't know what to do with mm -hmm. them. So the teacher is very important that we have those who have the God-given gift of yes. teaching to teach. Mm -hmm. Now, now the, the teacher has to meet certain criteria. So mm -hmm. in, in um, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, there are some qualifications for teachers. They will be held in higher, uh, uh, higher standards of judgment. Mm -hmm. The teacher should be an example. Should have a testimony of being saved, sanctified, and filled. We are Pentecostal holiness. The Church of God in Christ believes that mm -hmm. that one has to be saved, sanctified, and filled. So we choose the teachers that meet that qualification. Mm -hmm. They should be a person of prayer, mm -hmm. should be well furnished in the scriptures, one who is learning at all times. They should be open to every member of the body of Christ. The teacher of the Sunday school, the kindergarten Sunday school teacher should be just as respectful and, and given just as much respect as a teacher of the men and the women's uh, Sunday school classes. Mm -hmm. These teachers should be respected. They shouldn't get a high, you know, uh, lifted up because they do have the gift of teaching because we know some folks that can teach and mm -hmm. they feel good about it, but we can't be lifted up if you have the gift of teaching. They should be quick to obey when light comes into their own path. And you know, as teachers, all of us, the three of us are teachers. And you know, sometimes when you start teaching something, it gets you too. And so Absolutely. when you realize yeah. that that's something I need to do quickly, you should adapt and, mm -hmm. and change your own path. As soon as the light comes on, the qualifications are made very clear for us in uh, Timothy, the third First Timothy, the third chapter, verses eight through 13, okay. those qualifications. So a teacher has to meet certain qualifications. The teacher also has to have passion. You have to have passion. Passion is simply showing a strong tendency and, and willingness through spending time and energy on an activity that someone likes or believes in. You can tell when you hear Dr. Primus talk and you can hear when you hear Dr. Lawrence talk, they are passionate about what they do. They know it and they show it. Passion is kind of contagious. If you're not a passionate teacher, your, children, your students <laughs> won't catch on. Bishop, right. Bishop Ford used to say, if you catch on fire, someone will come to see you burn. That's right. <laughs> so you've got to have a passion. Being passionate is closely related mm -hmm. to learning and experiencing new ideas. Passion is identified with hope and loyalty and care and enthusiasm, which are key features of effective teaching. Mm -hmm. Passion is an important factor. If you drag into your class not prepared and, and, and you know you, you you sorry you came or you're late that doesn't show passion right we need passion teachers that are qualified and teachers that are passionate because that motivates not only the students but it motivates you too when you have a passion about what you sure are is. doing All it right. really does mm -hmm. um the next you must have a commitment to becoming more Christ-like. Mm -hmm. Now, a teacher has to be one who is a doer of the word, not just espousing and teaching, but you have to be a doer of the word if you're a true teacher. James 
1, 22 and through 24 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Yes. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So we've got to be doers. True teacher, a true teacher is one who <laughs> learns and then passes it on to others. All right. A true yes. teacher is a doer and a hearer of the word. A true teacher learns from Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost through Bible reading, studying, meditation, as well as all of a spirit-filled faith, learn from spirit-filled men and women. Mm -hmm. All of us have learned from those who have taught us in the past. Mm -hmm. And then you take what you know as a teacher and pass it on to others. So a teacher must be a doer of the word. And, and then, then teachers should be lifelong learners. Mm. Should, 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 you know, be committed to being Christ-like and be yes. a lifelong learner. Yes. Remember, we never arrive. We're mm. always <laughs> learning. Surely. We're always learning. And, and it's a lifelong learner. We, we're learning from Jesus and we want to follow him. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not, it's not a, a sprint. As a teacher, when you take on the task and you have that God-given uh, gift of teaching, yes. it, just, it just comes naturally. And I mean, sometimes it kind of gets a little, we, we, we kind of get a little overbearing sometimes. Because we we're, we're teaching all the time wherever we go. Sometimes <laughs> if we see something wrong, we we we're gonna help. We're gonna help wherever we can, and that is a, a, one of the true signs of a teacher. Teachers always want their pupils to be better. They want their students right. to get it. They want to see some changes in behavior. If you teach Sunday school in a certain class for years, and those ladies, because I taught a Sunday school class for years, and I could see growth, but I would be very disappointed if I spent every Sunday morning teaching that class and certain principles that All had right. been espoused and, and never saw a difference. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, we as teachers, we need to see a difference yeah, in the absolutely. students as we teach them. We should right. see a teacher, see, yes. a, see a difference. So remember that we are all, and teachers are students of the word, yes. and they should live by the word and follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, the next is that should teachers teach with the authority of God? Well, a teacher is under the authority of God mm -hmm. and therefore under the authority of God's word since it is primary the God's word and how God has revealed himself to us. Yes. Everything we know must be filtered through the authority of God's word. We don't learn, learn everything there is to know from the Bible, but we learn how to learn everything there is to know rightly from the Bible. Mm -hmm. The teacher is a shepherd as well. Yes. It, it mm -hmm. is to be like an under shepherd or you could, where we could say we are under teachers. A teacher <laughs> only has as much authority as is being faithful to God's word. A teacher has obtained authority or obtained instructions and we get our yes. instructions and that's why the holy ghost is very important yes when you read the sunday school book and sometimes you, you read other resources you have to have a, a, an unction of the holy ghost to give you the right direction to go so a teacher is under the authority and should teach uh with passion and pass on those instructions from god that they receive to others a teacher is solely the medium are the conduit. We're not it. The word comes mm -hmm. from him. 
then we are to receive the word and then pass it on. We have no message message of our own as teachers. We don't have a message of our own. So true. We are to shepherd and to teach under the authority of the message that we've been given. Yes. James 3 and 1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my brother. <laughs> but you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So those who have the gift of teaching and are called to teach are who we need in our, our uh, programs, our Christian programs. But be sure All right. that they are spirit led and under the, teach under the authority of God. Wow. That is I, wanted to add, I wanted to add something to this discussion. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wells, you have brought out so many wonderful points about this, about uh, qualifications of a teacher. And when I think of this whole idea of teaching in the church and who should be teaching, the first person that comes to mind is the pastor. Of course. The pastor, in my estimation, and as we, you, you, what you use the Ephesians scripture, where he calls some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Yes. Mm -hmm. When we look at that whole idea of uh, the last portion there, uh, pastors and teachers, it really should be understood that the pastor is teacher, the teacher <laughs> pastor. Yes. And so that the main function, when we really look at that and understand that, what it's really telling us is that the main function of the pastor is to teach. Mm -hmm. And so that, the, that that pastor becomes our model, our master teacher in the church setting. Uh, I, but I, 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 I want to say that because there are the five. Yes. Each one of us, each one has a different office. A pastor is a teacher, mm -hmm. but he's not, he's not given the specific task of teaching. He's given that leadership role and a shepherd type of leadership. And of course, what Bishop Clemens used to say, that we are blessed in the Church of God in Christ because we have teaching priests. We have pastors yes. who are excellent teachers, mm -hmm. but suppose you're in a congregation and the teacher is, is not, the pastor realizes that his gift, and he recognizes that they are gifted teachers, then mm -hmm. I think that it should be acknowledged because sure. if you put all five in there for the edifying of the mm -hmm. body. And, and that's not to say that the, uh, the pastor or preacher is the only teaching person in the church. We ought to be one of them. Yes. And, okay. And, 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 yes, exactly. And the, but that yet there are other people in the congregation that also have that gift of teaching. Yeah. Well, um, I had, I had, um, I found something that was talking about that the fivefold. Okay. It says that the apostle is the dream awaker. Mm hmm. And the prophet is the heart revealer. And the evangelist is the storyteller. Mm -hmm. And the pastor is the soul healer. And the teacher is a light giver. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we all have our, our functions. And mm -hmm. all of it, it takes all of that for us to grow up in, in the body. And, and I guess when we Christ all recognize, life. when we all recognize and stay in the lane that God has stay given in to lane. us. That's, that's Mother Crouch. <laughs> yeah, stay that's in right. lane. <laughs> so recognize what lane you're supposed to be that's in and it, stay in it. that <laughs> lane. Stay there. Stay there. Okay. And one other thing I wanted, to, wanted okay. to add to this conversation, too, is that uh, you raised the point that uh, we, there are people that are anointed to teach. And yes, we have person that have that anointing to teach, but along with that anointing, that that person who has the anointing ought to take the responsibility, as you said, to want to grow. Yes. Uh, even though we have that anointing, we ought to pre continually prepare ourselves. And I would hope that as we look at enhancing the teaching ministry in the church, in the local church, that we would look at 
some type of program to properly prepare our teachers, just like we prepare people to be ordained elders to preach. Yes. Well. Maybe there ought to be a another track of study to prepare those people, yes, who have the anointing, who have that calling, but yet we need some type of preparation program. Because as all three of us know, because we've been in the education field, we know that it took, what, four years for us to understand how right. to get out there and yeah. teach. And that there is some uh, educational theory that has helped us to function better. And I would think that there are some things that we can bring to the uh, church setting to help our teachers do an even better job of teaching. Well, one of the things that's already in place is the C.H. Mason Jurisdictional Institute. Uh -huh. yeah. And, they, yeah. and there, there is training in yeah. teaching ministry. So uh, they, we do have have something already in the church <laughs> but a lot of our a lot of times the saints do not know so i think we need to uh as far as our educational ent entities of the church of god in christ we need to start tooting our horn a little mm -hmm. louder amen and i think amen. we have to realize the teachers to realize that they are teachable there's always room for improvement mm -hmm. yes yes you have to be a lifelong learner Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wells. All right, we're going to move on. We're now going to our objectives. All right, how will we enhance the teaching ministry in the local church? Now, we have talked about the what, we have talked about the why, we have talked about the who. The question now is, how can these goals be achieved? All right, so the first objective is, that is uh, to incorporate systematic Bible study and scripture memorization in the Christian education curriculum. And so when we look at systematic Bible study, all right, that, that, that's an objective. Use systematic Bible study. We should have a plan. We should have a course of action that we will follow. And then we should use a method that has been tested and that has been proven. So in other words, we should have some stated guidelines that we will follow, all right, in our systematic Bible study. All right, any comments, Dr. Wells or Dr. Uh, Williams? I, I certainly have a comment there, you know, and you, you emphasize the word systematic Bible study. And I think it's important that when we look at a systematic Bible study, it's not that we're, well, we decide this week, well, I'm going to teach this one thing. And then next week, oh, well, I'm going to teach another thing. I think there ought to be a plan in place so that we make sure that the things that need to be covered in the course of a year are covered. Uh, when we look at God, mm -hmm. God is a strategic God who planned. God planned for our salvation long before we came along. He made a plan for us. And if God is strategic and he is a planner, then we should do likewise in our handling of the church, that we should have a system, as you indicated, a plan that we follow so that uh, by the time we get to the end point, we know that we have covered A, B, C, and D all the way all down right. to Z and have completed it. Amen. All right. And then we have, uh, we have scripture uh, memorization. Now, I don't know uh, about you all, but I'm sure, uh, and I'm a little older than you all, and I, we might be <laughs> of the same age, but back in the day, we had the little Bible cards that we used to read in Sunday school, and we used to have to uh, remember those scriptures. And the next Sunday, from Sunday to Sunday, we had to quote those scriptures to make sure that we had memorized them. And so that was something to help us. So when we look at it now and even think about uh, the Sunday school books, they have a memory verse. We look at the YPWW book has a memory verse. The Home and Foreign Mission has a memory verse. And the Bible band has a central, uh, they have what you call a central verse that we can focus on. And I think I was talking to Dr. Uh, Williams at one time and he was saying, we don't pay attention to those memory verses. We just read them and, and bypass them and keep going. But it's important that we memorize scriptures because it would help us as young people, uh, I would say from children to young people to adults, 
it would help us to understand the Bible. And so remembering and memorizing those scriptures played a major role in helping us back in the day. And it's something that I think that we should incorporate uh, today in all of our lessons, the Sunday School and the Bible Band, the YPWW and the Home and Foreign Mission. And then let the children have little uh, competitions that uh, they can find out who, who remember all the scriptures that we've had this month and give mm -hmm. them some type yeah, of award. Yeah. And this will motivate yeah. our, uh, and I think Dr. Williams said our adults too, but this will motivate yeah. <laughs> our uh, children and our young adults and our adults as a whole, mm -hmm. all right, to memorize the scriptures and to focus on what is being said so they would help us in the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to put that in context, uh, Dr. Primus, when we think about memorization and memorization in the scheme of the learning process, mm -hmm. memorization is the foundational block of learning, yes. literal level learning. We can't get to the more advanced levels of learning until we memorize. That's we, we won't be able to get to comprehension, analysis, uh, synthesizing, yes. all of that. We can't get to that until we have gotten to the point of memorizing scripture. Amen. And the thing is, in order for knowledge to move from our head to our heart, we've got to have it memorized. You know, one thing that I thought about when the uh, other, I'll say, reformations come to our door and uh, mm. they be witnessing to us and they be talking to us, uh, they can quote the scriptures verbatim. Sure they just know it by memory. And uh, when we, someone asks us, all right, what do the Bible say about uh, salvation or this or that? So we say, okay, hold on, let me get my Bible or let me let me mm -hmm. look it up right quick. So it's good that if we could memorize uh, all of this is to help us. Uh, we used to memorize John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We knew that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the 23rd Psalm, Psalms 100, we knew that. So what's wrong with us, you know, that, Memorizing would help us to be more stable and more dedicated and have more of an understanding of what we are teaching. Sure. All right, if we just put it in practice. Mm -hmm. All right. Our second objective is to develop consistency in the use of a curriculum by communicating these goals and objectives to all teachers, not just some. And Dr. Wells certainly has done an excellent job on talking about uh, the qualification of teachers and how well we're supposed to be prepared. So how will we enhance this teaching ministry in a local church? How will we develop consistency? All right, we want to be consistent in whatever curriculum we decide to use. And Dr. Williams had talked on that. We want to know what we are dealing with. We want to be focused on one thing and not all over the place. So that when we come up with the curriculum, we will be on the same level that the pastor is. Whatever the vision for the church is or whatever the vision for the pastor, the Christian education department should have that same vision. Mm -hmm. So we want our, or desire our teachers to perfect their presentations. Now, Proverbs 99 tells us uh, to instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they would add to their learning. They would add. So what you already have, you want to add to that. So that is why that 2 Timothy 2 and 15 tells us to study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we want to always add to what we have. So we want our teachers to be organized, prepared, how to get the students involved in the material that is being discussed. Because our attention span is only so so go so far. All right, it's very short. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, and so we want to keep our students involved, and we want to keep them uh, in practice and and participating. All right, when we have our class discussions mm -hmm. and what have you. All right. Want to add to this when you when this statement talks about uh, communicating these goals and objectives to all teachers, Bible lets us know that we ought to write the vision and make it plain. Yes, yes. Write the vision. We Our goals and objectives for ev every local church ought to have some goals and visions for it. Uh, yeah. And it ought to be written 
so that everybody understands that and that everybody is consistently saying the same thing without the vision, without the clearly stated goals of where we're going and what we want to teach, we're going to be all over the place. But we want to have focus. So it's important that these goals be crafted and that they be communicated to everybody so that there is consistency. Yes, very good. All right. And the third objective is based on the teaching received in the Christian education classes and programs, the members of the Church of God in Christ will learn God's word through teaching and apply God's word through service. All right, learn God's word through teaching and then apply God's word through service. So after we have taught our students uh, through the different classes and the different programs, we want to know that they now can apply what they have learned, all right, or what they have been taught. And so their service and their lifestyle will represent holiness. All right, any comments? And, the, and that is the true the true um, evidence mm -hmm. of how effective the, the ministry has been. If you see that the word is being applied to life through service, mm -hmm. that they understand the word mm -hmm. and then can apply it through service. That really is uh, the evaluation tool, I guess you would say, because mm -hmm. when you see mm -hmm. that there is a change you see that progress is being made. It's it's through effective teaching and, and a good education, Christian education program mm -hmm. in the church. Some things the pastor won't have to deal with if Amen. you deal with it in your Sunday school class. Sure right. enough. You know, and I think that speaks to the point too that uh, in our church, you know, uh, we have, we typically say that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Yes. Most of the work in the church is done by a small fraction of the that's congregation. Right. Yes, that's true. And actually what we should be striving for is not just for the 20% to do all of the work, but we ought to strive to get 100% of the people participating and doing the work of yes. the ministry. So what and I think things, it, it, go ahead. I, one of the things that we can help them is to uh, understand the gifts that they yeah. have. We mm -hmm. have a lot of people that are not doing anything because they have not recognized their, their spiritual gift. Because mm -hmm. I just do not believe that the Lord puts people in local congregations that are not there for a purpose. Amen. I think that it's divinely orchestrated that, that I'm a, a member of the church that I'm a member of because so. there is a place there that I can fit into the ministry. And a lot of, we have a lot of, of folks that still have not found their place. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we can help in the uh, Christian education programs and classes is to help folks to, to realize and be aware of their spiritual gift. And mm -hmm. then they can, can work in, in the service of the Lord. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And now we're going to move to how will we enhance the teaching ministry in the local church? or we can utilize what is already available to us. Now, <clears throat> we have a Church of God in Christ website. We have a Church of God in Christ a bookstore that has plenty of material that we can glean from. I was looking on the website uh, the other day and we was looking at the children ministry that has been established for 2021. And it's a great ministry, it's an online ministry because we know most of the churches have been closed because of the pandemic. But to have this ministry online for our children, I thought was, was, just, was just awesome. And so that our children could continue to learn all right, from the Bible teaching and what have you. So in the children ministry that I was looking at, they have Bible lessons, they have Bible stories, they have little games uh, that the children could play. And so great resource. All right, that was available from the Sunshine Band on up that our children can utilize while uh, they were at home. So we do have resources, all right, through our Koji uh, bookstore and through our Koji website that is very uh, helpful to uh, our children. And then we have the Puritans, and I love the theme, let Puritan reign. All right, the Puritans 
if they have learned different things uh, in the Sunshine Band, now they can act on it as teenagers. And then we have uh, Young Women Precinct Council to help the young women to become mature and to become godly women. And then we have the adults, all of the classes and books and things that have been prepared for our adults. And one uh, book that they have is Becoming God's True Woman. And I thought I looked at all of these things that we do have, uh, the singles, while I wait, I will serve. We have information for the married couples, the senior citizens, the mother's board, and all of these and leadership. We have information that's already there, all right, for leadership. Uh, how do we become great leaders? We have leader manuals that has been already put out there to help us. And then we have the ministers and the missionaries guide to help us and to teach us how to be ministers and how to be missionaries. And then we have the ministry groups that they can come together and encourage and motivate each other how to be more effective in their ministry that they are providing. So we do have some resources that we can fall back on through the coaching website and through uh, the coaching bookstore that would help us all right, to enhance the teaching ministry in the local church. All right, any comments? Well, I'm glad to know that we have those, those resources. And when we talk about being um, lifelong learners, when we find uh, learn something, then we have to act on it. So mm -hmm. if you didn't, didn't know the books were there, and now that you've learned, then let's, let's use them. Let's use them. Mm -hmm. yeah, you want to utilize those. It's very good resources. All right, Dr. Yes. Okay. No, no comment on it. All right. All well right. said. Well said. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to deal with what is your church doing? Mm -hmm. right, we, we, we really have talked about the who, what, the uh, how. All right. And now we want to know what is your church doing? All right. Does your church have an active Christian education department? And after listening uh, to this presentation on tonight, I'm pretty sure if you do not have a Christian education department that's active in your local church, you really would want to have one now. Mm -hmm. So does your church have an active Christian education department? If not, let's get busy because we all need to know that the Christian education is the foundation of a growing church, of a mature yes. church, and will mm -hmm. help our church to be more effective. All right, in winning souls for Christ. All right, in teaching others how to teach. All right. And I think just to add to what you're saying there, uh, I think one of the good starting, a good starting point is to maybe appoint a Christian education director. Yes, yes. And I think having that person in place would help any local church to begin to have an active Christian, Christian education department. And that's a key um, person. We know that every good group has to have a good leader. Yeah. So choosing the right person, a person who has the gift of administration mm -hmm. to yeah. be the leader of the education department, one who can work well with, um, with others, one who has some ability and able to organize and come Absolutely. up with a good program. Now, every program is not going to be the same because our churches are different sizes yes. Yes, the truth. and different numbers of people in your congregation. So we can't say you go to a small church and expect to have every class right. that, that we've, we've recommended. No, but you can combine some of the classes. And that's why yes. It's, yes. it's key that the leader be a good administrator and know how to... Um, improvise and, mm -hmm. and, and make it happen. You know, where there's a will, there's a way, and there, there's really? a way that some of the classes may be combined, but can still serve um, all ages mm -hmm. uh, in a proper way. Okay, and that's true. And even uh, with the small churches, they can have someone to come in all right, and to help set up their Christian education department. So it's good to use outsiders, you know, to come in from the Church of God in mm -hmm. Christ, to come in and help to build that Christian education department. So when the church do start growing, they can easily put people in place. So sure. that is true. 
All right. Dr. Williams, does your Christian education department line up with the vision of your local church? Dr. Wells, what do y'all think about that? <laughs> I know I think one thing. I know it's key. Yeah. If you if your if your program and, and in our black book, it says that the that the pastor mm -hmm. is the CEO of yeah. that of that church. So your Christ, your department has to align with the vision. And we believe that God gives the vision for that church to mm -hmm. the pastor. Mm -hmm. So the education department has to be in line with the pastor. So anyone who is, is, he appoints should be able to work well with the pastor, yes. understand the pastor's vision, and then be able to carry out that vision through yes. the uh, educa Christian Education mm -hmm. Department. All right. Has to line up. And if you have- Absolutely. A, if, if it's not lining up, it's then we're here work. to tell you today, <laughs> if you're gonna enhance your program, you All better right. get it in line. There you go. Man. Gotta be in line with the vision. Yes, if it don't mm -hmm. line up, it will not be- It won't. It, it not, doesn't uh, need uh, to no, exist. No, mm -hmm. no, no. Gotta line up. Mm -hmm. All right. Amen. All right, Dr. Uh, Williams, are yes. you using multiple resources, including <laughs> technology? All right, let's expound uh, on that. Oh, I think that this is a very good one here that I think as a church, we've got to avail ourselves to uh, many different ways of getting the word of God across to people. And I think it's, it's important to understand that we've got all different types of people in the church. Okay, we have all different types of learners. People learn different ways. Yes. In education, they tell us we've got visual learners, we've got auditory learners, kinesthetic <laughs> learners, kin uh, tactile learners, technology learners. Today, that, that's a new one that's added into the mix. And people learn differently. If we look at the way we do most of our preaching and teaching, we are reaching just the auditory learner. All We've got right. some people that can hear a sermon and they can tell you just about everything yes. you said in that sermon because they're good auditory yes. learners. All right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But what happens to the learners that are visual, tactile, kinesthetic? They don't get much of it. No. So we've got to devise certain different ways of reaching those people so that they too can walk away with the same message. Yes. You ask the, the average person that listens to a service on Sunday morning, All right. what did the preacher preach about? They can't tell you the title, can't tell you the scripture. They can't tell you three points from that sermon. Amen. And that, that preacher, that pastor has spent 40, 45 minutes yes. to an hour yeah. giving his heart right. to the people. Yes. And what do they walk away with? Nothing. All right. So we've got to, we've got to begin to utilize even in the preaching moment. Yes. The preaching moment ought to be a teaching moment. They ought to carry something away. You know what? That's probably the largest classroom quote that we have in the church. Right. Most of the people come to Sunday morning service and we don't see them at Bible study. So we've got to have a, a way of reaching those people while we have them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the Sunday oh, morning So what service. about oh, what right. about that? I've heard some some uh, <laughs> don't even want a big screen in the, oh. in, the in the sanctuary. So right, is that is that a, a bit of technology that we we kind of need now for those yeah. those visual learners? <laughs> I think you're right. You are exactly right. Though we may not want them big screens, I think we're moving into a time when we're seeing they are going to be very useful. Amen. I agree with that. All right. And then our next one are, are you seeing any changes in the lifestyles of the believers? And I think Dr. Wells has already talked on some yeah. of that uh, earlier uh, when she did the who uh, will be able to teach and I thought those was good. Dr. Wells, did you want to expand any more? Oh, well, uh, okay. I think, I think that this is the real, the real test. Mm -hmm. When we see the children that can say some Bible verses, yeah. when we see the young adults being engaged in some type of mm -hmm. learning, 
uh, as far as, you know, we, we almost all of us have vacation Bible school. But right. when we see the whole church involved in vac vacation Bible school, mm -hmm. that's a learning opportunity. And when they, they have the whole family there, where they mm -hmm. have age appropriate classes. But when there is a theme, and then you see a change in your believers, then mm -hmm. you know that it's been successful. If mm -hmm. we don't see changes in the lifestyle, mm -hmm. and we know our lifestyle is the lifestyle of holiness. Yes, yes. yes. Amen. Being mis district missionaries, so yes. Dr. Primus, and I'm a district missionary. Amen. If I if I see if I, I see someone who comes into one of the churches and they have a certain lifestyle because that's what they been used to, mm -hmm. but then we teach, we have workshops, and you still see them looking just like they looked last year when you first, mm -hmm. and then uh, something, something is right. Wrong. Our teaching should, we should see a change in the lifestyle of believers if we have effective, yes, mm -hmm. effective Christian education in our churches mm -hmm. and i think too one of the things we ought to look for in changes in lifestyle is to look to see that every person in our ministry learns how to teach and i say that because we have people that are parents mm -hmm. parents have the responsibility of taking god's word and teaching it to their children. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility wherever we are to teach God's word. Just like you were saying, Dr. Primus, we have people from different reformations coming to our doors, knocking on our doors, yes. and they, they have learned how to teach God's word. Yes. Wherever we are, we've got to have the ability to teach God's word. So for me, the change we ought to look for is to make sure that we are developing every person in the ministry to be a teacher. Amen. And I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right. And now the last one is that the church budget <laughs> reflects the importance <laughs> of Christian education. I think uh, Dr. Williams wanted <laughs> Oh, you know, that's right. my pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Williams. <laughs> well, I, to to right. me, <laughs> I, I think the church budget ought to reflect the vision of the church. Yes, yes. It ought to reflect what the church is doing. So if one, if the main emphasis, one of the main emphasis of the church is teaching, then the budget ought to reflect that. Yes. Right. When we look at what the money is being spent on, is a good portion of the money being spent on things that are going to provide teaching opportunities and experiences for the congregation? I'm just suggesting that we relook, reevaluate our church budget to be sure that it's reflecting the emphasis that we want it to reflect. Amen. And if we say we want a good Christian education program, just mm -hmm. the colloquial way is we have to put our money where our mouth is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you if you if you saying it, then yes. put your money where your mouth is. And they Surely. say I you can it. tell about saints. You look at the checkbooks, but nobody has a checkbook <laughs> much anymore. But you look in the checkbook and yeah. you see where most of those checks are being written, and you can tell mm -hmm. how how uh, you know how liberal somebody is and how they sure. believe you see they paid their tithes they paid offerings every sunday they gave uh to the benevolence fund us so, but but when you say and then there's no evidence mm -hmm. that, uh, you got to have some evidence that you really believe mm -hmm. in this program amen and I, I think really what it causes us to do as a church is to make some budgetary projections yes Yes. We ought to, we, right now we're sitting at the end of 2000, 2021. Mm -hmm. Every church ought to be looking at the budget for 2022 <laughs> and making right. some projections and saying, this is where we want to make our expenditures for 2022. And, uh, and, and I want to say as, as, as Church of God in yes. Christ, we need to learn to support our um, yes. publishing house yeah. For our literature, amen. Mm -hmm. Because we yes. now this this year we're using the legacy series. We're not using the international Sunday school lessons. 
So we need to purchase our own from our own because you mm -hmm. find sometimes they slip, slip a little bit of the Calvinistic uh, mm -hmm. the theory in there, doctrine in, yes. and we're not. So we we need to we need to patronize. Amen. Our own. The, yeah, the ones that mm -hmm. uh, our our program that teaches our Amen. doctrine. Amen. All right. All right. Uh, would you all like to have a closing statement, Doctor um, Williams and Doctor Wells? We want to have your last closing statement oh, yeah. for this session. Uh, we thank God for you. Would you like to have a closing statement at this time? Yeah, just in closing, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to have had this platform and this forum this uh, this evening to really discuss the teaching ministry because I think the teaching ministry really needs a greater emphasis in our church. And if we're taking cues from what the national church has done, the national church has created the newly formed education commission that's mm -hmm. taken a look at uh, what's happening at the national level. And likewise, we need to do that same thing in our local churches. And I'm just glad that we've had this opportunity to speak to that and glad to have been a part of it. And I want to thank Dr. Bennett for creating this opportunity. Amen. All right, Dr. Wells? I would agree. This has been a great opportunity. And I thank um, Dr. Bennett and, and the committee or whoever selected us. I the, the teaching ministry is close to my heart, and mm -hmm. I just want us in all of our churches, no matter what size your church is, I want you to enhance it. Yes. You may have something going, but make it better. Make mm -hmm. the best better. Those who have really good programs, you think they're really good, but think of ways to make it better. And I, it's been a pleasure working with Dr. Primus and uh, Dr. Williams, as we we get got this pre presentation <laughs> together for you. Amen. God Thank bless. you. All right. God bless you, Dr. Williams and Dr. Wells. And in my closing, Christian education is a necessity. We we understand that now. We know that we are giving you some resources uh, for our presentation tonight. We have the Church of God in Christ uh, publishing house, a bookstore. We have the website for the Church of God in Christ. But we also want to give you some other resources that you can uh, use or utilize in setting up your Christian education department. We have a future of Christian education. This book was written by Charles Foster and it deals with educating your congregation, which I think is a very good book. We also have a website that you can look at, the importance of the teaching ministry, all right, and Christian Education Ministry Manual that you can go to the website and pull those up and that would help you to enhance your teaching ministry. And then we have the teaching sermon by Ronald A. Allen. That is very good to help you prepare sermons uh, for your ministry and it would help you to even sit down and have a class to teach for your ministers in your church. So on tonight, we thank God for our presenters. And if you would like to get in touch with us, we do have that on the uh, website tonight that you can look at Dr. Goldie Wells and her information, Dr. Lawrence Williams and his information, their phone numbers is available, their email address is available, and also mine, Dr. Catherine Primus. So we have that information available for you also. So as Christian teachers, we want to do more than just inspire our students to love academics. We also want to make a sincere and a lasting impact in their hearts and lives. So as teachers, let us strive to help students to grow in character and in wisdom. And then we can rejoice when we see them applying the word of God in their lifestyle. So as uh, Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, whatever we do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Bennett, for giving us this opportunity, all right, to come forth and make this presentation on tonight. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Wells. It has been a pleasure working with you all. May God bless you.
God bless you. And I think the world of the goodness of the Lord. I think the world of the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. We're there educating men and women for ministry in the Church of God in Christ in the world. In fact, Mason's graduates, Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, our graduates are serving all over the world. In fact, from the grounds of the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary have come general board members, have come pastors, missionaries, evangelists, college professors, military officers, chaplains, just we are everywhere and we're there because you care. And I thank the Lord for you and your gifts. I invite you to join me in this ministry of giving. Would you join me as we plant a seed in the education ministry of the Church of God in Christ in the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary? I have my device here and I, let, let's do this together. Let's do this together. I'd like for you to join me. Please consider sharing a gift of $50, $50 uh, with the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. $50 will help purchase a book. $50 will help us defray the cost of tuition. $50 will help us help young men and women, you know, get the quality education that they need to make a difference. In the world, join me, $50, $50. Would you, I have my device. Let's do this together. Let's do this as a team. Let's do this as a team. There, there are multiple ways that you can give. You have your device. You can give uh, via Givelify, $50 through Givelify. And what you want to do is search for Charles H. Mason Theological Seminary. Got it? Yeah. Charles H. Mason Theological Seminary. You can give using uh, Venmo or Zelle. And what you want to do is use our phone number or the email address. And our phone number is 404-507-4853. That's the phone number for the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. And the email is C Mason Seminary. 1970 at Gmail. You can use your Zelle or your Venmo. You can use Givelify. You can give via snail mail. You can write out a check. You would make the check payable to the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. And you would mail the check to the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, 700 Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. That's Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, 700 Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. And you'd make the check payable to the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. Come on, I have my phone. Let's give right now. Let's give. Let's go on and give. Let's give $50. Let's go on and do the $50. Thank you so much for your giving. All right. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, thank you for everything. Thank you for your givers. God, thank you for the well-wishers. Thank you for those who are praying for the school. Lord, we pray that this hour, God, that you will bless the givers. Bless those who are praying for us. God, and we pray in the blessed name of Jesus that you will continue to bless the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary through the ministry of giving. Thank you for your people. Thank you for these gifts. Lord, you're wonderful. You are the blesser. Continue, God, to do what you do. And we pray, God, that these gifts will be used for the reasons and the purpose for educating your men and women, Lord, like you sent them. In Jesus' name, God, we will do your will. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you. Come on, give yourselves a hand. Give your hands. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Darren Waters, Sr., Senior Pastor of Bridge Builders Christian Center in Valdosta, Georgia. 
and member of the Olympic class of 1996. Receive the benediction for this evening. The Lord bless you as Christ follows, as you walk by faith and not by sight. The Lord bless you as his representatives to teach with power and authority that others may come to know God and make God known. May the King of Kings infuse you with his spirit and govern your minds so that God's peace may be in and with you both now and forever. Amen.